Thank you. Good evening. Lucky last in the first session. How are we all going? Good. Okay, so two things are vitally important when it comes to thinking about how to act now in a time of mass species extinctions. One is that we need to know why it is that we are not doing more to prevent species extinctions. The second is, what might be the best course of action to prevent species from going extinct in the first place? So these two questions can be whittled down to what is to be done and why don't we act? Now this is particularly important for Australia, which is a world leader when it comes to making animals extinct, something which you won't find reproduced on our glossy tourist brochures. Australia is actually in the top four worst in the world for species extinctions, or actually the worst if you factor in population density. The red list, which was set up in 1964 by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, puts Australia fourth out of 250 countries that have lost animal species. So why are we so good at making animals go extinct? A study by Australian conservation biologists Wanaski, Burbage and Harrison examined this anomaly of Australian extinction rates, finding them to be unresolved, baffling and contested. But at the same time, they point the finger at cats, foxes and the loss of Aboriginal fire-based land management as the three major factors that are driving this decline. These three, cats, foxes and fire management, all come with what they refer to as the rapid continental, continent scale replacement of a purposeful and long established indigenous land management regime by a substantially more exploitative and transformative set of land management practices. Another word for this is settler colonialism. It brings the cats, the foxes, sheep, cattle, pastoralism, all of which rapidly alter habitats through the annexation of Aboriginal land and the removal of Aboriginal people from their land. Colonisation brings with it pastoralism, and this is a fundamentally transformative and extractive way of managing country. Pastoralism and the farming of mostly sheep and cattle is now the dominant land use across much of Australia, about 55%. And this, of course, brings with it land clearing, habitat destruction, the end of fire stick farming often, and the persecution of animals such as the macropods and koalas. The effects on waterways are also significant, leaving animals like the platypus in significant decline. The scientists surmise that over 100 species of small mammals are currently facing extinction. Pastoralism is also at the heart of deforestation and habitat loss, which the UN has uh, described as the principal threat to species across the country. Again, this is something that Australia is excelling at. But some experiments involving the removal of livestock, such as this one near the Murchison River in Western Australia, show how dramatic the impact of cattle can be and the capacity of land for recovery. Two months after the publication of this particular scientific study into the causes of species extinctions, which, remember, pointed the finger at cats, foxes, loss of Aboriginal land management practices and pastoralism, the federal government's environment minister, Greg Hunt, declared war on feral cats, an announcement that made international news. I love this headline. Australia actually declares war on cats. Now, given the other factors causing extinctions, cats are taking up a fairly heavy burden here. And this raises some really interesting questions about how the cultural politics of eradication works. And I use the phrase cultural politics because I'm interested in finding out how eradication programs work with specific cultural ideas and beliefs. Why do we choose this course of action and not that? Other options that are clearly on the table include decolonisation strategies, returning land to Indigenous management, 
and significantly reducing livestock numbers. But these remedies more clearly locate the problem of extinctions with a broader structure of settler colonialism. Decolonisation is apparently not an option here, so instead a war is declared on cats. The other option is literally unthinkable within settler colonialism, that it might be us and our agricultural habits that make us the pests. So, to sum up this problem, settler colonialism causes extinctions. Settler colonialism mounts eradication campaigns to counter the extinctions it causes. The other option, that settler colonialism should be eradicated, is unthinkable within settler colonialism itself. And this is why eradication programs exist, to make it clear who the pest is. And the pest can never be us. It always has to be some other animal. This team of scientists and many social scientists working on the issue of extinctions are also concerned not just about the extinctions themselves, but also why it is that people don't seem particularly moved by them. Why it is that we show an emotion close to what one theorist has described as stuplimity, which she describes as a combination of shock and boredom. And this is something that really interests me as well. Why are we not so moved by extinction events? Now, part of the reason is that the terms of the discussion are dominated by a seemingly objective language of science that tends to shut out the human side of the story at certain points. Extinction is, pr is frequently pronounced without a sense of human agency. They went extinct. They became extinct. So-and-so was declared extinct, as if the animals take themselves there. So the word extinction itself is taxonomic. It works at the scale of population, and it describes a condition of a whole species death rather than the conditions under which deaths come about. And this distinction is really important in a political and ethical sense because how we represent animal deaths matters greatly when it comes to attaching ourselves or distancing ourselves from the problem. And the word extinction and the phrase, they went extinct, does little to bring home how humans are connected to what can seem a merely biological fact process. So, tackling our connection to the problem of extinctions will actually mean shifting animal agriculture from a depoliticized norm to a politicized question. So rather than simply blaming the cat, we would need to also tackle pastoralism. And we would need to tackle Australia's highly cultivated meat-eating habit. Animal agriculture has a very strong voice in public policy and it's folded intimately into national identities, as shown here by this poster from the 1950s, which was designed to educate adult migrants on the Australian diet. <laughs> meat and a little bit of meat and a little bit of dairy. This promotion of meat eating as being an essential part of what it means to be Australian has not actually really changed that much over time. And it's something that you'll recognise from recent, more recent MLA advertisements that promote eating lamb as a way of actually being Australian. So meat eating is encouraged as a national pastime at multiple levels. It's politically supported by taxation and through generous access to land. But at the same time, we are frequently told and tell each other that diet is a personal issue not a political one. And this is part of the reason that it's so, much, it's so much easier for the Threatened Species Commissioner to organise a mass eradication of cats rather than to curtail pastoralism. Because if we were to curtail pastoralism, we would be asked to consider what it is that we're eating. 
organising a mass eradication of cats, doesn't ask anything of us other than to condone more violence against animals. And this time they're conveniently also labelled feral. So they're even further down the moral hierarchy. It's not just in the area of species conservation, of course, that animal agriculture gets off the hook. It's also the case when it comes to climate change. Despite animal agriculture contributing more to climate change than all of the world's transportation systems combined, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was initially reluctant, indeed afraid, to call for a reduction in meat consumption. So scientific solutions have to bend and conform to political agendas. Sometimes the scientific solutions can look straightforward. Reduce the land mass used for animal agriculture. Eat less meat. Return the land to Aboriginal management. But these ideas fail to get traction in the world, particularly when they, when they come up against a thick and complex set of beliefs and cultural practices that are deeply embedded, practices like pastoralism and meat eating. So mammals in Australia are not simply going extinct. They're being eradicated by particular cultural beliefs and practices. And these are the practices that we need to take a really good look at, or else we're stuck doing little more than blaming the cat. Thank you.